What's up? Good morning, everybody. My name is David, and I get to be a pastor at this amazing church called Vertical. We are so happy that you guys have decided to join us for our online celebration today. Hey, do me a favor. We're going to go into the sanctuary real quick in a second, but before we do, hit that share button if you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on YouTube, Church Online, wherever you're watching. Let someone know that we are live. Share hope on your stream to somebody today, uh, and we want to make sure that you're not watching this alone, that you're letting people know that church is happening right now, and they can be a part of it for free. But without further ado, let's go into the sanctuary worship, and then we're going to hear a message from Pastor Ken continuing his series called Joyride. We're so excited to have you in spirit with us in this moment. We're here today to worship our God. And Father, we just pray that you show us your glory in this morning. We're so excited to have you with us, Lord. Yeah. 
We give you praise this morning, Jesus. We invite you to dwell among us. There is no one above you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Darkness trembles at your name. We worship you because you're holy and righteous. The storm surrounding me, let it break at your name. Still, call the sea to still, the rage in me to still, every wave at your name. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Breathe. Call these bones to live. Call these lungs to sing once again. I will pray. Jesus, 
you silence fear Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus can we sing it one more time oh Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus everything has to bow you silence fear Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. By the name of Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we call on the name of Jesus. Oh, hail the King of kings. Oh, we worship you. What a privilege to be in your presence, Jesus. We honor you. We praise you. No matter what's going on in our lives, we praise you. We bow before you. You're still good in every situation. You're righteous and holy sovereign over everything there was a moment when the lights went out when death had claimed his victory The king of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. There on a cross they made for sinners. For every curse his blood atoned. One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens rose
praise you this morning, Jesus. We give you everything, Jesus, this morning. We put our whole trust in you, Jesus. Holy, holy, holy. There will never be enough thank yous. There will never be enough thank yous. You laid it all down for us, Jesus. You laid it all down. You paid the ultimate price for us, Jesus. How can we thank you? How can we thank you? How can we thank you? There will never be enough thank yous. This is what we live for. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you are in the midst of us, that you are with us in every situation. We thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. We thank you that you paid the ultimate price. So this day, we thank you. Where you are, just thank him. Thank him for everything that he's given you. Thank you for pain. Thank you for everything because it just draws us closer to you, Jesus. So this morning, we thank you, Lord. That's all we have this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, I love the talent of the people who come and call Vertical Church home. I'm grateful for our worship team to be able to lead that way. But I'm so happy that you guys are watching as well. If it's your first time here, don't forget in the comments, somebody's going to have a connection card link that you can click and you can fill out to let us know that you're watching today and somebody can reach out to you. Uh, but beyond that, I have two quick announcements for you today. The first is we are still continuing our back to school drive. If you feel led to participate in this special offering, please do. You can go on church online, verticalct.com slash give. Um, and there's a drop down bar that you can click where it says back to school donations. If you want to feel led to give to this initiative, if you want to help the schools of West Haven, especially during this hard pandemic year, you can do that today. And I have another exciting piece of news, and that is this. If you've been praying for this moment, if you've been fasting for this moment, if you've been believing God for the day that you get to come back inside the church here at Vertical, that day has come. I'm excited to announce to you guys that August 30th will be our first in-person service held here since March, uh, which is going to be super cool. We're going to have two services, one at 9 o'clock a.m. and one at 11 o'clock a.m., both of which, if you want to attend, you have to register online to attend. So you can register for free tickets at verticalct.com, okay? Verticalct.com, and you can come be a part of the service, and we are so excited for what God's going to do on August 30th. All right, family. Well, now we're going to take a quick turn and I just want to take a second and say thank you to the faithful members of Vertical Church. Thank you to the people who call this place home, to the people who give weekly of their finances to make sure that the week to week, day to day operations of this place continue to happen. A couple seconds ago, we talked about a special giving opportunity uh, for the donations to back to school, but now we're talking about the tithe. So if you're here and you're wondering, hey, Pastor David, how can I give? Number one, somebody's gonna give a link in the comments where you can click to give, or you can use your phone, you can use your laptop, wherever you're watching, go to www.verticalct.com slash give, and you can just fill out the information as it asks you for, the card information, your name, all that stuff, and then you can designate how much you wanna give to a tithe, or if you wanna do a special offering, you can do that as well. But no matter which way you give, mailing a check, online, however you do it, thank you. We can't keep doing what we do without your support. And I want you to know that we see it, we thank you for it, God sees it, and we're gonna continue moving forward. In fact, let me take a second and pray for the offering today. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the faithfulness of your people to give week after week. Bless them in a supernatural way. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you guys again for your giving.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Church Online. I'm Pastor Ken Vance, the senior pastor of Vertical Church, and welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your schedules to connect with us here. Just love the opportunity to communicate God's Word. And so wherever you're watching this from, I encourage you to put aside all the distractions because I believe God's got something amazing for each of us today. But before we go to the message, can we all take a moment and pray together? I am believing God for a true change in our nation. With all the difficulties, with all the, the problems that have beset us, we desperately need God more than ever. And our power as believers is in our prayer. So can we all pray together? If you would, bow your heads with me right now. Father in heaven, we come boldly to the throne of grace. Lord God, to obtain your mercy and find your grace that truly does help in time of need. Father, we live in a land that so desperately needs you because we are divided on every front. Like the days of Elijah, but the scriptures tell us, Lord, that as Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, he prayed earnestly for the rain. And so, Lord, we pray that the outpouring of your Spirit would come upon this nation to turn many from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to you, that we might find true healing, that we might find breakthrough, that, Lord, you might reign over this land because our hope is in you, both to rid us of coronavirus and to heal our land. Lord, today, we just trust that you would empower your people, grant us with all boldness, we would speak your word. And Father, we are asking you to stretch forth your hand to do signs and wonders and mighty deeds in our day. Because we want Jesus to be famous across our land. Thank you, Lord, that your ear is open to our prayers as we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey guys, we've been in the series called Joyride. And I called the series Joyride because a joyride is an adventure. And me following Jesus is an adventure that's exciting, it's thrilling, and should bring joy out of every aspect. We're not limited to our circumstances because we've learned the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is dictated by what's going on around us, but joy comes from within us. Joy comes from God. It's that living a Christ-centered life. It's learning to let Jesus be in charge because it's that attitude that recognizes that we're a part of the story of Jesus. And when we begin to see life from that point of view, it changes everything. So in this series, We've discovered we can have joy no matter what because there's joy in living. We learned last week that there's joy in serving because we're most like Jesus when we're serving others. Because although Jesus was God in a bod, he laid himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. Jesus said that the greatest among us is the servant of all. And we most embody Jesus when we're serving others. And so in essence, we can experience joy. And so today, we're going to look at, this is the title of today's message. It's Joy in Knowing. Joy in Knowing. If you have your Bible, you can turn to the book of Philippians chapter 3. We're going to dive into chapter 3 and we're going to look at it in this end. We're going to talk about the joy of knowing because, listen, this is the big idea today. And that joy comes from our relationship with Christ. Joy comes from our relationship with with Christ. Look what Paul wrote. Philippians 3.1 says this. It says, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Notice what he said. Where is our joy? Where is the source of our joy? He said, rejoice in the Lord. That's where joy comes from. It's in the Lord. He says, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. So Paul here tells us not only where the source of our joy is, but he's about to give us safeguards that keep our joy. Why? Because we have an enemy that attempts to steal our joy. And so Paul here gives us this because the word safeguards in the Greek language, the word safeguards literally means this. It's a negative form of the word sphilo which means to trip up. So it's a secure, safe. Safeguard is to keep one from tripping up. Paul's about to give us some understanding of the things the enemy uses to try to trip you up, to try to steal your joy. And that's why we need to put these on as a safeguard. Examples of a safeguard, a safeguard's like putting on a safety belt when you drive in your vehicle. Why? 
because if you ever meet a difficulty, your safety belt keeps you secure within the vehicle instead of being thrown out from it. It's why they put guardrails on highways because they're all there to safeguard your journey. And so Paul here is telling us as journeying for Christ, there are things that our enemy will come along and attempt to do that steal our joy. But when we know better, when we understand, and that's what's important today, that's why I need you to pay real close attention because these things can come to all of our lives. And when we know them, we can take the wisdom of Scripture that Paul gives us here to safeguard our joy because we can have joy no matter what. And so the first one, that we see the very first safeguard to our joy is to resist legalism. To, re to resist legalism. Look what Paul writes here in verse 2. He says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those manipulators of the flesh. Paul, one of his chief adversaries, when he'd go in and preach the gospel of grace, he would tell the story of Jesus Behind him would come these Judaizers who tried to legalize this end of it. Oh, what Paul wrote to the Galatians, he said, what you guys have begun in the spirit, are you now going to be made perfect in the flesh? That's why Paul had no good words to say with respect to those that would try to trip them up because legalism is something that tries to knock on every one of our doors and sell us a package that doesn't lead to joy. It leads to misery. And he says this again, Watch out for those dogs, those evil, those evildoers, those manipulators of the flesh. Verse 3. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. What we need to recognize is that legalism is actually a work of the flesh. Legalism is a sense that I can keep the right rules, do the right things, and that's what makes me right with God. And you know what? All truth, legalism is a lot easier than living in relationship with Christ. Because all we want to know is just tell me the rules. I just do these things. And therefore, it's not actually dealing with God. It's just dealing with ourselves. Legalism is very self-centered. What it produces, whether we realize it or not, legalism produces a sense of self-righteousness. That's why when you find legalistic people, not only do they have a superior attitude, they're generally not very joyous people. And so and then he goes on to say this, verse 4, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Look what he says. Paul talks about his own life. Circumcised the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin, as a part of the inner circle. He had grown in Judaism to a very prestigious role. He said, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. Verse 6. As for zeal, persecuting the church. One of the things that legalists are famous for is attempting to spoil everybody else's freedom and joy because they become obsessed with what people are doing. Paul thought that this, what became known as the sect of the Nazarene, the followers of Jesus, what became Christianity, Paul thought this was an abomination. These people are leaving all of the laws of Moses and they're following Jesus. This isn't right. And they were angry. They were upset. Paul thought he needed to purge the world of this atrocity, these followers of the Nazarene. He said what? In his zeal, he was persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, look at this, flawless, flawless. So in essence, Paul had it in, what we need to realize, legalism, let me give you a definition of legalism. Legalism is confidence or dependence in rules over relationships. It's dependence, a confidence that I follow the rules. But let me be real with you this morning. One of the funny things about it is, whose rules? Because when you've been, I've been at it this long enough. Everybody has different lists. And what's right and what's not right. And the fact is that legalists become obsessed with what everybody else is doing. Because legalism is based on a faulty belief. And what is that belief? 
<laughs> Here it is. I'm going to call it out for what it is. Legalism believes that the only way to truly have fun is to sin. But because we're restrained by God, because legalists believe God is a killjoy, that God comes to spoil the fun of humankind. So to follow God is to do what you have to do, not what you want to do. And you see, the reason why legalists can be so mean is because they want to do what others are doing and don't feel the ability to be able to do so. So they want to spoil everybody else's freedom and joy. You see, legalists are obsessed with me. And see, when I came into Christianity, there's all sorts of, because we can be deceived into this. We come into Christianity, we know the freedom that there was nothing we did that caused us to be saved other than to accept the gift that was given. See, Christianity is not about what I do, it's about what's been done. We're saved by faith, and that not of works. It is a gift of God. But you see, the idea of gift, you know, in the flesh, you ever have somebody give you something that you didn't deserve? You didn't feel you were worthy of? Immediately, we try to want to do something back. We want to turn, because we are hard to receive. That's pride. And legalists are saturated in pride because it's about what I do. It's about who I, what, what I've accomplished. And people who are legalists are fundamentally always trying to say, well, you have to do this and you have to do that. And like I said, all the lists, all the rules tend to change. When I came into Christianity, people said, and back then there was no such thing as PG-13. When I got saved, it was PG and it was R when it came to movies and then X. And nobody, nobody on any side of the aisle thought X was a good idea. But the legalist said, you cannot go to an R-rated movie. You're not a follower of Jesus if you attend an R-rated movie. Other legalists would say, if you had alcohol of any kind, you could not truly be a follower of Christ. I mean, legalism gets into crazy stuff like, what do you dress like? I mean, you ever meet? The, 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 the fashion police that tell you what's right and what's wrong based on their opinion. And the thing about it, that's the crazy part. So much with legalism is about opinions. It's about ideas, about what I think is right and what I think is wrong. And one of the things that really sometimes people struggle with, can I help you with this? Because I, I don't want to be too tough on this front. We can have personal convictions. And depending on where we've come from, there are some people in their lives that to do some things, is not wise for them. That's what the scriptures actually teach us. When we walk with Christ, we should ask the right questions. Not how much can I do without going too far. The true question we need to ask is, what's the wise thing to do? And sometimes based on our past, there are things that we should probably should avoid because it's a slippery slope that might take us back to a place that we're not strong enough yet to stand in. And it's a good idea not to. If anybody's ever struggled with alcohol in the past, that's something that they not need to go to. And our liberty in Christ should not be a stumbling block for others. Personal convictions are just that, though. They're personal convictions. I, unfortunately, what I've watched in Christianity is somebody who has a personal conviction considers it the law and judge everybody else by their personal conviction. I remember walking this road years ago. When I came into our church um, so many years ago, the dress, the appropriate dress attire was a full suit. Well, I was a college student at that time. Uh, I didn't wear suits. So I, when I first came to church, I felt so out of place, so uncomfortable, okay? And the only appropriate Bible I understood back then was a King James Bible. Now, to be honest, when I got born again, I was, again, I was a college student, so I wasn't stupid. But I thought it was kind of quirky that people talked in ways that, you know, the King James Bible was written in 1611, okay? Uh, we don't talk that way anymore. So why would we read a Bible that was so antiquated and ancient? Because Jesus didn't say thou, okay? <laughs> That's what they soak in 1611. But we don't talk that way today. So I thought it was kind of quirky. So I went to the a Barnes & Noble, bought an NIV Bible, read it cover to cover, fell in love with the Bible. But kind of along the way, I became persuaded by all of these that say, no, 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 you got to have this or you got to do it this way. And, you know, unfortunately, people have struggled in Christianity based on the rules. You know, some churches, 
if you were ever divorced, you weren't welcome in those churches because you couldn't truly be a follower of Jesus if you actually broke the vow of your coveted commitments. And we have made people feel horrible. Legalists sometimes can be really mean people. And if you've ever been guilty of it, just say amen or oh me. But here's the point. We can be free from that because it will rob your joy. You have to resist legalism. You know, legalistic people, again, they're miserable. Because legalistic people look around at all the people that are having fun in their freedom and want to be like them but feel constrained that they can't. And that's why when you find out sometimes when the, when the window is opened or the curtain gets pulled back, that people who are truly legalists have some pretty shaded secret lives. Yeah. Because you have to resist legalism. That's a tool of the enemy because it creates, this is what it creates, a sense of superiority. That I'm better than other people. Jesus illustrated it in one of his most famous parables when he talked about the tax collector and the Pharisee that went up to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. And he went through all of the litany of things that he did and why he was right before God. And the tax collector just beat his breast and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said one of them went away that day, justified. You see, it's humility that brings about the grace and mercy. And because here's the lie of the enemy. Legalism, whether people realize it or not, is an attempt to save yourself. You see, we couldn't save ourselves. That's why God sent to us a Savior. But whenever you take on the responsibility of saying, well, I have to do this and I have to do that. And legalists, the best they have is happiness because if they do what their tasks say, you know, I read my Bible. See, people can do good things and turn them into bad things. Legalism is when you take something that God intended for good but you make it a law and then you kill it because 2 Corinthians 3 tells us the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. God wants a relationship with us. See, taking something like reading our Bibles, legalists will say, I'll have to read these many chapters a day. So you read because you have to, whereas God wants us to read and, and be inspired and maybe just even one verse can bring life. But reading a whole book can actually literally bring no joy and almost death. So you have to resist legalism. Legalism is a killjoy. Legalism is something the enemy uses and you can get, you can trip up into that so easy because it seems so right, but it's devoid of relationship. We are to walk with God and follow what he tells us to go his way. See, it's easier to be a legalist because you say, well, what movies can I go to instead of actually following your heart? And one of the things you have to resist as a Christian is to get away from judging everybody else but simply be about you and God. Because again, legalists become overly obsessed with where everybody else is. Second thing Paul tells us, that safeguard that we need to keep our joy is to realign our ambitions. Realign our ambitions. Ambitions are what? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to do in life? And it's not wrong to have ambitions, but sometimes they need to be realigned because before we came to Christ, for sure, our ambitions were all about us. What did we achieve? What did we do? What status did we gain? What things did we obtain because people judge others based on how much they have or what position that they have? And here now Paul redirects on this end because look at what he says. In verse 7, he said, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. In other words, Paul said he had gone through the litany. Paul's ambition as a young Jewish man was to attain to these heights of being in the Sanhedrin, being one of the esteemed uh, uh, um, Pharisees, one of the leaders of the nation of Israel. And now Paul, when he met Christ, says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Verse 8. He says, and what more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of, notice this, of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For those, for, for whose sake I have lost all things and consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Notice again what Paul says here. All these things that were once prestigious. Now you may have 
a, a, a degree, you know, a post-grad degree. You may have multiple initials after your name. But here, Paul is saying, in reference to knowing Christ, all of the rest of those things really don't matter. Because guess what? In heaven, people won't be addressing us by Dr. So-and-so or CEO or whatever other things we obtain in this world. Because Paul, Jesus said it this way. He said, to gain the whole world and lose your soul is to get ripped off. And in essence, Paul is realigning our ambitions because he says what to him? Everything was a loss except the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And because of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, he said, I, for those things' sake, I've lost all things. In other words, all the prestige, all the things that once were honorable to me, which once opened doors for me, which once gave me opportunities. He said, no, none of those things matter anymore. What really counts, what's worth it, what I am, what I want to, my focus, my effort, if you want to know what I'm about, Paul said, it's to know Christ. There's nothing more important. There's nothing more valuable. There's nothing worthwhile more than knowing Christ. And he said he consulted all these things garbage. Look at this, the word know. And Paul said just knowing, knowing is the word gnosis. And it means this, it's experiential knowledge to know intimately. Paul didn't want intellectual knowledge about Jesus. He wanted experiential knowledge. He wanted to know him. He wanted to understand not only who he was, but he wanted to experience the life that Christ wanted to live through him. Remember, as we talked about this series, that joy comes from an, a, a, an attitude of seeing our lives as part of the story of Jesus. Paul wanted to know Jesus so well that he could surrender to him in every way to let Jesus live through his life, to realign his ambitions, to know Christ. This was his desire to know him intimately, to know him like no other, to know him so personally that I, his voice was apparent, that I will do what you say do, go where you say go, because I am totally and completely in love with you. The word genosis in the Old Testament, they used the word yada, to know. And the Bible says that, that Adam knew Eve, and she became pregnant and bore a child. The most intimate part of the, the human relationship between a man and a woman in the act of marriage is to know. To know somebody so personally, to know somebody so intimately. That's the joy and the beauty of marriage. Well, the New Testament tells us that the relationship of a believer to Jesus is like a marriage. Paul said, I want to know him because he is the love of my life. And he said everything else, notice, he said everything else was garbage. The word garbage in the Greek language is the word scubula, scubula. Now, the translators that translated this from Greek into English, I don't think had the guts to truly translate this word as it would, because he said, it's this, the word can mean whatever is thrown to the dogs, refuge, dung. In other words, Paul said, it's literally poop. In other words, Paul is, li he is dropping the S-bomb. He's saying all the rest of this stuff, pff, it's poop. It's not worth anything compared to knowing Christ. Pff, the rest of it is refuge. It's garbage. It's poop. It's literally then. So, you know, when we find these ends of it, Paul was talking about, really, promotions at work, are they for us or are they for Christ? Because all the things that we attempt to achieve for ourselves, if it's us that's at the center of that end, then we've missed the mark. We've lost our way. We have had a wrong. Because ambition is what are you trying to achieve? And the question we have to ask ourselves is what am I doing? Is it for me? Or is it truly for Christ? Because in essence, what I do, it's to the glory of God. It's to the honor of Christ. It's not about me. It's all about him. And if it doesn't mean anything, if God says to drop it, then no big deal. And that's what we struggle with sometimes. Because sometimes our possessions, when God says, no, I want you to give that away. We can have every rationale and reason why not. But Paul said, listen. 
my car, my house, my reputation, my career. It's all scubula. It doesn't matter. All of it compared to knowing Christ matters nothing. To have true joy is to know a love relationship with Jesus. Because whatever we have in this life doesn't last into the next. The only thing we take with us is what we do truly for Christ. And when Christ is at the heart of it, we can have joy no matter what situation we're in. Because all things, he said, if it's lost, all of this Paul was willing to lose for Christ. Because what he goes on to say in the next verse, he said, to be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own. See, what we do in our own strength, in our own power, doesn't matter. It's all scubula. It's poop. Compared to knowing Christ, he says, what? Well, I don't want to have my own righteousness that come. He says, but not having a righteousness that comes by my own, but comes from the law. In other words, what I do. He said, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. It's out of that relationship of knowing him. It's out of that relationship of doing what we do because of our love for Christ. I'll go where you say go. I'll do what you say do because I love you. It's all about you. You know it. When you fell in love, think about this. If you're married out there, you know that when you fell in love, you're willing to do anything. You, you go anywhere, you pay anything, you do anything for the person that you love so desperately. And when your love is pure, it's not about anything you gain in return. When your love, true, a beautiful marriage is when two people try to outserve one another and outlove one another. Because it's just about giving of myself. Paul said he came to that realization, that that was the aim. That was what his goal was. Because he goes on to say this in verse 10. He said, I want you to know Christ, yes, and to know the power of his resurrection. And a participation in his suffering. See, his joy, knowing Christ, meant the good times and the bad. In the beauty of the power of God working in my life and in the sufferings that sometimes following Christ can bring. He said, becoming like him in his death. Verse 11. And so, somehow obtaining to the resurrection from the dead. Paul said, listen, I want to be so dead to the world that the world is dead to me and I'm dead to the world. He's talking about the things that entice us because many times in our ambitions, if we're honest, often people's ambitions can pull them away from Christ, not to Christ. How often have I counseled people that tell me they don't have time for a devotional life because I'm too busy in my work, too busy in my career, too busy in my pursuits. But I'm gonna tell you what, if we've allowed anything to get in the way of knowing Christ, we've been ripped off. It's poop. It's scubula. It doesn't matter. And here Paul said this, I want to know Christ. I want to know the good times and the bad. I want to experience life like he lived it because that's where true joy comes. Because when you have found love that's so sincere that way, it doesn't matter. That's why when we stand on an altar, we say in sickness and in death, till, or, or in sickness and in health, till death do us part, right? Why? Because true love means I'm with you no matter what. And that's what Paul said. I'm with Christ no matter what. So it's realigning our ambitions. And then the last one he tells us, the safeguard is we need to reject complacency. Reject complacency. And this is something we all struggle with. Complacency is that idea that we become satisfied. And too often the problem is when we're brand new to Christ, we want to know, we want to do, we want to go. But after we've been with him for a while, we can get to the place where we're living off of where we've been as opposed to where we need to go. And complacency can be dangerous because look what Paul says here. He says in, in verse 12, he says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Notice what Paul says. Now, Imagine with me for a minute. Think, who's, read, who's writing this? This is the Apostle Paul. Think of all the things that he'd achieved for Christ. Think about all that he had written to the church about Christ. I don't know anybody in this life, you know, physically, that had any more revelation about Jesus than the Apostle Paul. And he's saying, it's not like I've already obtained. 
or that I have already arrived at my goal. If Paul hadn't arrived at his goal, how much should we be warned not to become complacent? not to stop stretching, not to stop growing, not desiring to move forward and to move on. He's saying here that, listen, you have to, you have to reject complacency. You have to not be satisfied where you've come to. You can't be satisfied with what you already know. There's more to know. There's more to grow. There's more to learn. There's more to achieving that intimate and personal relationship with Christ. There's more that God wants to do in and through our lives. You can't be looking in the rearview mirror. And the fact is, this is something where the enemy attempts to entice human beings to because there's no such place as neutral. Whenever you stop pushing forward, whenever you stop pursuing forward, whenever, Paul says, I stretch forward to reach because when you stop moving forward, unfortunately, you don't stay still. You start to move backwards. Because until you recognize that there is no neutral place, the stream of the world is going away from Christ. And when we stop pressing on to know him, we drift along with the world and we end up drifting away from Christ. And Paul, in his, in his warning here, he said, listen, don't allow complacency to get a part of it. He says, what? I press to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I press toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me in heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I'm stretching out constantly. And the question I have for you is, when's the last time you let God stretch you? What are you actively attempting to believe God for? What are you actively pursuing? What are you actively attempting to learn and to grow and to achieve? You see, when it stops becoming about me, there's more that can be done. There's more that can be uh, uh, gotten in that end. We might have grown, but are we giving away what we know? Are we helping others grow? Are we helping others succeed in their walk with Christ? See, God is always, because here's the aim. What are we aiming for? Conformity to Christ. You see, the problem is when the word sin is translated in the New Testament, it means to miss the mark. Sometimes we're not aiming at the right target. Because Paul said the ultimate aim is to know Christ and we should never become complacent because our joy is found in him. Remember, that's the big point today. That our joy is in Christ and we need to stay with him. We need to walk with him. We need to grow with him. We need to stay and allow him to stretch us and to grow us. And we can't ever become satisfied with where we've been because there's more to do. There's more to obtain. There's more people to reach for Christ. There's more people to grow in Christ. There's more for God to do in and through our lives. We can't ever get into that place of settling for where we've been. We have to press on. And what does he do? Paul tells us two things responsibly. He said, forgetting what's behind and reaching forward to what's ahead. He says, it's important to reject complacency. See, you have to forget two things. What do we have to forget? Number one, you have to forget your failures. Because one of the things that stop people from progressing forward is failure. We feel like we've messed up. We feel like God's through with us. We feel like he's kicked us to the curb. That you, we have a way of condemning ourselves. But I want you to know the truth. The Bible says there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. God is for you. God is with you. God is not going to kick you to the curb. God will help you to keep up and keep on. You have to forget. So what's the worst failure? That has is, that is plagued you, that has got on you, that has held you back. Because that's your responsibility is to forget that. You have to forget your failures. But also, secondly, what do you have to forget? Sometimes you have to forget your successes. Because, because we've already achieved something, we don't feel we need to keep going forward. No, 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 no. It's like I just, been, I, I just got through watching this series on Netflix called uh, The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. And one thing about Michael Jordan as a basketball player, he was never content with what he won last season. Every new season, he was out to win the ultimate. And how much more as we in Christ, should we never be content with where we are? Never be content. People will say, well, Pastor Ken, isn't the church big enough? And I tell people this all the time. I have for years. The church will never be big enough until all the, all the family members in your family know Jesus, to all the people in your neighborhood know Jesus, to all the people you work with know Jesus. If there are people that don't know Jesus, our church is never going to be big enough. See, we can't be satisfied with where we've been. We need to be content to move on, to let God stretch us. So you got to forget 
your failures. You got to forget your successes because you got to let God continually stretch you. So these are the safeguards that help us to stay in joy because our joy is in our relationship with Christ. So you got to resist legalism. You got to refocus or realign your ambitions and you have to reject complacency. If we will follow those simple safeguards that Paul has given us, we can have joy unspeakable and full of glory no matter what comes our way. Let's pray together as we close today. Father in heaven, encourage and inspire your people. I truly pray, almighty God, that we would experience a joy, a joy that comes from within, that we would work together with you in allowing your spirit to produce through our lives a joy that is a strength to us. I pray, almighty God, that we would resist legalism, that we would realign our ambitions. We would reject complacency and put the safeguards in our lives so that we can walk in joy day in and day out. And no matter what the enemy brings our way, we can have joy in the midst of it and overcome. Thank you, Lord, today. Encourage the hearts of your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, listen, if you've been watching with me today and you've never actually given your life to Christ, if you've never received the gift, because salvation is a gift. It's not about do, it's about done. It's about what Jesus came and did on your behalf. The Son of God came out of heaven and died on a cross for you. Why? Because he loves you. But because he loves you, he will never force his will upon you. He offers a gift, a gift of more than just forgiveness, but a gift of a right relationship with God that came because of what Jesus did for us. He offers the opportunity to come into our lives and be our personal Lord and Savior. Today, if you've never made that decision before, if you've never prayed to ask Christ to come into your heart, and be your Lord and Savior, I'd love to pray with you today. If you'd like to make that decision right now, wherever you're watching this from, just say this simple prayer with me out loud together right now. Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you became a human being to die for me. I believe that not only did you pay for my sin, but you arose from the grave. And today, I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. You see, the Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Wherever you are today, if you prayed that simple prayer with me, whatever means you're watching this on, on Facebook, live stream, um, YouTube, there's a place in the chat box area where you can fill out what we call a connection card. It's just a simple way. We'd love to pray for you by name. We celebrate today the decision that you made. We want you to know you are a new creation in Christ. And the vision, our mission here at, at Vertical Church, we see this, that we'd love to help you in these ends. But our mission is reaching and leading people to take their next step with God. We would love to come along beside you to begin the, the journey because God has so much more for you. So in any way we can serve you, we would consider that an honor. We're not going to hassle you, but we do want to pray for you. We love you. We applaud you. We'd love for you to take that few moments, fill it out, and give us the opportunity to serve you in some way. Thank you all for watching with me today. Guys, don't let the enemy steal your joy. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Have a great day. See you back next week. Thank you, Pastor Ken, for that amazing message. Well, y'all, before we go today, I want to just take a second and let you know that Backstage Pass is happening directly after the 10 o'clock service. If you want to know what that is, if you're new here, you've been checking Vertical Church out for a while, you want to have some questions, you want to talk to somebody who's here at the church, maybe you want to talk to a pastor to get to know more about what we offer, then Backstage Pass is for you. All it is is a quick Zoom call. We bring you through a quick presentation about our church history, then you get to speak to a pastor. Today, of course, it's me. Uh, and we can talk about anything you want to know about our church. How do you sign up? It's easy as this. Look in the comments. Someone should have already commented with a link where you can sign up or go to our website, verticalct.com, and you can sign up. As soon as you do, you'll get a link. You click it, you join us. It's that simple. 
If you want to know more about the church, I hope to see you today. With that being said, I love you, family. We'll see you guys next week. Stay tuned to everything happening here at Vertical Church throughout the week, especially on social media platforms. I love you. Have a good week.